Hey guys, Annie and Ella here. We're the hosts of Undiscovered, the new spinoff podcast from Science Friday. This week on Undiscovered, Gary King and Jen Pan thought they were testing a new data analysis tool. That's before they realized what they were really looking at. And then we got one that said, this post has been taken down, it's been deleted, or it's being investigated. Investigated. That's when we knew that we were encountering censorship. Decoding Chinese censorship on Undiscovered. Find us on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcatcher. This is Science Friday. I'm Ira Plato. It is an unfortunate fact that ever since Hurricane Katrina, New Orleans and flooding have become synonymous. But flooding is much more of a long-term problem down there. The soft soil of the Delta, coupled with sea level rise, has some coastal parts of Louisiana disappearing faster than any others in the country. Efforts are underway to reclaim some of that land, but state officials have said they won't be able to rescue all of it. And a recent study in Nature Climate Change estimates that by the year 2100, 13 million people could be displaced as a result of sea level rise, perhaps even sooner if you live in parts of the Louisiana Delta. Joining me now uh, to bring us that story, as well as other short subjects in science, is my guest, Tegan Wendland, coastal reporter for member station WWNO in New Orleans. Welcome, Tegan. Thanks for having me. I've only been listening since I was nine, so it's not like this is a lifelong dream or anything. <laughs> you're very, you're very kind. <laughs> I hope your mother's to listening today. <laughs> I think Mother's she day. is up okay. in Wisconsin. Be a nice uh, present for her Mother's Day. Well, let's talk about how fast is it? How rapidly are are stuff deteriorating down there? Well, they say a football field an hour, and as you mentioned, there are a number of different forces at play here. You know, partly. The land is sinking. It's a it's naturally this deltaic landscape built by the silty Mississippi River over millions of years. So it's naturally just sort of sinking. But in coming years, rising seas will be a bigger contributor to land loss here. So the state's been trying to restore and rebuild as much as we can through marsh creation projects and rebuilding barrier islands. But officials here are finally acknowledging that we're not going to be able to save all of the coast with these restoration efforts, that some of the coast will wash away and be gone forever. So the next challenge now is to get people out of harm's way mm-hmm. because we predict tens of thousands along the coast will have to move in coming decades. And that's just this region. Of course, this is playing out all over the nation yeah. and world. Yeah. Are, are there some communities already relocating? Yeah, it's happening already all over the country. This other report came out this week Uh, by the Center for Progressive Reform, looking at 17 communities that are already in the process of relocating. It happens that they're all Native American communities. The biggest challenge is really finding and acquiring new land to move to. And the hardest part of that is that it's expensive and there's no money for it. There's no real set federal or state funding streams to do that at this point. There was a resiliency grant given out by the Department of housing and urban development about a year ago to several communities throughout the U.S. But other than these, you know, sort of little pots of money, there's no set funding stream. So I spoke with one of the authors of this study, Loyola University law professor Rob Verchick, and he laid out some of those challenges. If you could listen to that clip now. Think about it. If, if there were a foreign power that were stealing land and destroying towns and villages in coastal United States, we would have an orchestrated federal plan to address that. Right now, all we have is, is a scattershot a- approach. Different agencies have grants available for things called resilience or sometimes coastal restoration, but they're usually very small. Yeah, you know, this is, this is the, what goes unspoken is, is how expensive it is to move all these people. When people talk about climate change or uh, sea level rise, they talk about what it's going to cost to to do things or not to do things, whether the public is going to be impacted. But they don't talk, they don't, on the other side of the equation, speak about what it's going to cost to move all these people. Right, yeah. yeah. Another professor I spoke to called it the next great migration. 
and this report in Nature Climate Change that you referenced in the intro kind of looked at where people are going to be moving and what cities would be seeing the biggest gains and, and losses. Like you said, 13 million people are expected to have to move mm-hmm. away from coastal U.S. counties by 2100. So that's uh, yeah. on the, <laughs> the near horizon. And this was the first study to really model this. It found that people tend to move short distances. They tend to stay near family and near economic opportunities and jobs. We really saw that play out here after Hurricane Katrina when many folks moved from the southern parishes, such as Plaquemines and St. Bernard. We have parishes instead of counties here. And they moved up to slightly to count to parishes that were just slightly north of there. And they tried to sort of stay around yeah. where their families and jobs were. So this particular study Estim- just made some uh, estimates as to which which cities would be the biggest losers and gainers. The biggest population losers projected in coming years are Miami, New Orleans, and the Norfolk area. And the biggest gainers would be Atlanta, Austin, and Orlando, cities that are still fairly coastal, but maybe a little bit safer. Yeah. Uh, oh, oh, all right, let's move on to the next story. There's a new report that highlights how uh, warming weather in the Arctic is making climate change even worse. Right. Yeah. The permafrost there is melting. Warming weather means more more warming weather, I guess. And uh, basically, as the permafrost melts, it's it's ground that's usually frozen indefinitely. As that happens, the microbes in that soil sort of wake up and they start chomping away at the old vegetation, thousands of years old. And as they digest that vegetation, they produce either carbon dioxide or methane as waste. And then that methane makes it its way to the surface and escapes into the air. And this new study published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences found that the Arctic is actually becoming a huge source of carbon as a result. So that's speeding up global warming. Hmm. So it's it's not that it's just sitting there on the ground. It's the it's the bacteria that, that are chomping on the the frosting tundra right, and yeah, the bec- cr- releasing all the CO two and the methane and things like that. Right. It's that interaction there with the microbes, sort of um, releasing the CO two. And this is actually kind of a big deal because previously we've thought of the Arctic as a carbon sink that it stores carbon, that it removes more from the air than it emits, and that's largely because there's not really yeah. a growing season there. Um, So this study really tests that theory. It found that CO2 from the tundra increased by about 75% since Hmm. the 1970s. I I wouldn't expect this new EPA to do a lot to combat these issues, would you? Well, I I can't really offer an opinion on that as a reporter, but the EPA recently uh, decided to overhaul its advisory board or one of its advisory boards, and a spokesman for the EPA told the New York Times that they'd replace those scientists with industry representatives. The EPA is responsible for setting environmental regulations, and this board sort of makes sure that those regulations are grounded in science. And the new EPA head, Scott Pruitt, decided not to renew contracts for half of the people on that board, which is kind of unprecedented just to see that number of people let go at the same time, even though they were term limited. And some environmentalists kind of see this as the latest in a pro-industry push. You know, Trump Mm -hmm. has said he wants to radically remake that agency. He removed references to climate change from the EPA website just after he took office, or at least called for them to do so. And he's pushed for deeper cuts to its budget, and want, you know, said he yeah. wants to yeah. roll back Obama-era regulations. Well, thank you very much. It's great, it's great to have you. Thanks for having me. Great to have you on, yes. Tegan. Tegan Wendland, Thanks, coastal reporter for uh, member station WWNO in New Orleans. And now it's time to play Good Thing, Bad Thing. Because every story has a flip side. Many of the songbirds you know and love migrate. They, they travel hundreds of miles in a year, but not a lot is known about where they go and how they get there. So researchers attach little devices called geolocators to the bird. These, these are little electronic chips that can record the bird's movements. But a new study published in the American Ornithological Society Journal, The Condor, says there may be a downside to this. Bridget Stutchbury, a research professor in the Department of Biology at uh, York University in Toronto, is with us now. She's an expert in these geolocator devices. She was not involved with the current study, but she knows all about this kind of stuff. Welcome to Science Friday, Bridget. Hello, thank you. Describe what the geolocator actually is. What's a tiny little tag, uh, smaller than the fingernail on your pinky finger, 
and it weighs far less than even a penny. So the, uh, the smallest ones are only about half a gram, and uh, they attach on the back of the bird like a backpack going around the, uh, the legs as sort of a, a waist harness. And they tell you where the bird has been on migration. They detect sunrise and sunset times. And when the bird comes back, you download the data, and you can reconstruct the migration route. Hmm, so, that, so that's the good news about this. Yes. Yeah, so it's really important to track these birds because uh, so many species are in really steep decline. Uh, migration has always been dangerous, and it's even more so today with all the light pollution and buildings and deforestation. So we need to find out what routes these birds take and where they winter so we can save those habitats and help protect the species. Mm -hmm. But this this new study found that there may be some cost involved here. Especially for smaller birds like the one they studied, the cerulean warbler. Uh, It seems to be that even carrying this small, tiny weight is enough to reduce their survival. So this one study uh, that we're talking about found that the uh, return rates of birds carrying the tags was only 50% of that of birds that didn't have the extra luggage to to cart around. One half of the birds never made it back. Wow. Uh, Do we know why that is? Yeah, it's pretty normal. In in these small birds have a short lifespan anyway, so Mm. under the best of cases... Less than half the birds survive migration, but if you put a geolocator on them, then only a quarter of them survive. Huh. So it's quite a significant reduction in, in survival, and we don't really know why they're not surviving, because, well, we know they didn't come back. Could it be that they're so tiny that the, these tags get in the way of them flying or air resistance or something like that? We, well, one study was done in a wind tunnel um, showing that these geolocators, they have a little stalk that sticks up so that they can detect light levels. And it's thought that that might interfere with the good aerodynamics. You know, you know, airplanes are nice and sleek and smooth. Well, so are birds. And so we think that these tags could possibly increase the energetics costs of migration. And, and maybe they just run out of energy at the worst possible time. So, so it's then just a judgment call on whether using these is a good idea. Well, certainly for the larger birds, like I've studied wood thrushes and purple martins and uh, tagged hundreds of birds with geolocators, and we've shown the survival rate is just fine. Mm. So I think the larger birds are able to carry the extra load. It's the smaller ones that seem to have trouble. So you want to make sure you keep the numbers that you tag relatively low and to to be really sure you know that you have an important question that you need answered. Dr. Stutchbury, thank you for joining us. Hey, you're welcome. Bridget Stutchbury, a distinguished research professor in the Department of Biology at York University in uh, Toronto, Canada. Remember that South African cave where scientists found thousands of bones from an ancient ancestor a couple of years ago? Well, those bones have now been dated, and there are startling results about the age of the bones. And also they found a whole other little cave of bones there, too, with other interesting stuff in it. We're going to talk all about that after the break, so stay with us. Support for this podcast comes from Tile. What if you could find anything in seconds? Well, now you can with Tile, the tiny Bluetooth tracker that makes finding your things easier than ever. You simply attach Tile to your keys, your wallet, your laptop, even your bike, anything you don't want to lose. Then when something is misplaced, find it easily. Just open the free Tile app on your phone to see your lost item on the map, Then quickly find your item by making your tile ring, and it'll be back in your hands in seconds. And if it's your phone that's missing, just double press on your tile to make it ring, even on silent. Every day, over 2 million lost items are located with tile. So join the millions who have used tile to help find their lost stuff. Get yours today at gettile.com slash Friday and save up to 30% per tile on a multi-pack, plus free shipping. And because Tile makes the perfect gift, for a limited time, get a free gift box with a multi-pack order. Go to GetTile.com slash Friday. That's GetTile.com slash Friday. This is Science Friday. I'm Ira Flato. Two years ago, scientists announced a fascinating fossil discovery deep inside a cave in South Africa. They found remains of a new human cousin that, that they named Homo naledi, Space was so hard to get to that they assigned a group of smaller-sized people, they called them underground astronauts, to really squeeze into this chimney-like chamber and get out the fossils. But it did pay off, and now it seems it paid off big.
big because inside they found a staggering number of remains, 1,500 bones from up to 15 individuals. Homo naledi had to had a mix of both primitive and modern features, but there were still lots of big questions, like how old were the fossils? How does this species fit into the evolutionary tree? How did these individuals get into this deep, remote cave, and was it intentional? Hmm. This week, the age of the bones was announced, and it turns out they are a lot younger than expected. And the team has found more fossils in a second chamber. My next guests are here to take us through what these updates mean. John Hawks is a member of the team that excavated the cave. He's also a paleoanthropologist at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And today he joins us uh, from South Africa by, uh, by Skype, via Skype. Welcome back, John. Hi, Ira. Thanks for having me back. You're welcome. Uh, Susan Antone, who was not involved in these findings, has studied these types of fossils and cave burials. She's professor of anthropology at uh, New York University. Welcome to Science Friday. Hi, Ira. Thanks for having me. Uh, John, you were able to put an age on these bones. So as Johnny Carson used to say, how old is uh, Homo naledi? Well, we discovered that they are between 236,000 and 335,000 years ago. Um, It was a really hard job to try to figure out the age of these bones because that age range is too old for carbon dating. And caves are contexts where it's often very difficult to figure out exactly the context of the bones. So, So we, in the end, employed six different methods. We had 11 different labs around the world involved, some of the best labs in the world for different techniques. And, uh, and we sent samples to many of those labs double blind, which means that we sent them samples, didn't tell them where the samples had come from, including dummy samples that, that didn't relate to the bones at all. And, uh, and two different labs in these cases, so that we waited to see if they would give us independently the same results. And so what we have is, is the best answer that I think anybody could get right now. So you went through so much trouble. Why is that so important to pin down the age here? You know, we felt when we discovered these bones that there was a chance that, that they were an unexpected age. And we knew that if they turned out to be younger than, than, they expect, than we expected, um, it would be a big shock to everybody. And um, so, so put that age in context for us. Yeah. These bones look like, in many respects, very primitive members of our own genus, Homo, uh, fossils that lived between uh, one and a half million and two million years ago. On their morphology, the way they look, uh, a lot of people looked at them and said, well, that's about the age they should be. 236,000, 335,000 years ago, this is a time frame when Africa has some examples of very large-brained what we call archaic humans that are, that are actually quite close relatives to ours compared to what Naledi looks like, and possibly the immediate ancestors of modern humans themselves. Modern humans, the first ones we have from Ethiopia about 196,000 years ago. So we're really in a time frame where our species is originating, and these very ancient-looking, very primitive hominins that are you know, probably distant relatives of ours are there in this landscape in a place that we did not expect. And could they have been living at the same time as, as Homo sapiens? Yeah, I think that they overlapped with, uh, if not Homo sapiens, modern humans, at least the very close immediate ancestors of them, and, and other lineages of archaic humans that also existed in Africa. Our view of African evolution has just become massively more complicated in the last few years. Part of that is because we know from genetics we found the genomes of Neanderthals, and, and we discovered that, hey, some living people have Neanderthal genes. Now, Neanderthals were European, Asian. In Africa, there were also archaic lineages, and we've seen in modern people's genomes that there may be traces of mixture from them. So you have multiple lineages of, of very distantly related humans, and th- at least now we know these Homo naledi also in Africa somewhere we don't know how they interacted, whether they overlapped with each other, when one might have come into an area or left. It is now just an open ground in terms of trying to figure out what was going on in what was really the heartland of human evolution. Dr. Antone, what are your thoughts on this? It sounds like it's just an amazing find. Well, it is absolutely an amazing find, and so that's the first thing that we should um, really appreciate is that there is a lot more to be discovered and things that we don't um, 
we're not necessarily anticipating, right? I mean, we could mm -hmm. think about it like that game that you used to play as a kid where you had a bunch of dots on a page, all of which had numbers on them, and then you drew lines between them, and it gave you a picture, except for let's take away the numbers and a bunch of the dots and then try to figure out what the picture was. So this has added a few more dots, and then also now with the ages, it's added some numbers, right? Um, and it's different than we expected. Um, when people first looked at the anatomy of the things uh, that were found, um, folks suggested that you know they probably were pretty old because they looked kind of primitive in some ways, right? They had mm -hmm. kind of tiny brains and certain parts of their bodies looked like some of these um, older humans. But then some other parts didn't. They looked really modern. And so um, there was, you know, there's always a, uh, a kind of an idea that you want to look at what these things look like and then say, oh, I know how old they are. But we know that time and time again when we've done that, we've been absolutely wrong, and this is just one more example of that. So I agree with John, life's a lot more complicated than we thought it was a, a few years ago, and um, we've got a lot of uh, sort of exciting strands to, to pull together now. Now, the, the, there have been other discoveries of early human cousins, like uh, like they, those so-called hobbits, you know, that were yeah. on an island. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah and it, it hasn't happened yet uh this is the first time sort of within the African continent, and it's the first time that we've got this sort of later overlapping within the African continent. But let's also be realistic that the, the fossil record from this period of time is um, actually pretty sparse. And so, you know, we didn't have a lot to base the idea of one lineage versus multiple lineages. And, and now this group has provided some of that. Uh, Dr. Hawks, does, you know, East Africa has been called the cradle of humanity, the birthplace of our species. Does this find now in so Southern Africa sort of change this whole idea? You know, realistically, when we look at Africa, right, which is the second biggest continent, and in human terms, uh, through most of our evolution, was the continent that had most of the space that, that was really suitable for, for human-like creatures. If we look at it and think, we've got some great evidence of evolutionary history in, in parts of Ethiopia, in parts of Kenya, parts of Tanzania, parts, very small parts here of South Africa, and, and the rest of the continent is really largely unknown. You know, it's just what Susan's saying. The record here has been sparse, and we've been assuming that we could maybe draw lines between a few fossil discoveries, and, and that was going to tell us the answer. You know, one of my colleagues professionally said at one point, you know, every important event happened in this valley in, in East Africa, and it happened to be a valley where he worked, which, <laughs> which you know, <laughs> works well, right? <laughs> but, but we know now that's not true. You know, if, if we explore and find new localities with fossils, we, we've seen that, that often things are going to turn up that we didn't expect. Wow, wow. And, and I, I wouldn't it's say that it's a message of... A, a aspiring scientist, right? I mean, if you're that oh, kid yeah. looking for really something really exciting to do, go someplace where there aren't fossils and see what you can find. Yeah. Hmm. And, and these, uh, the initial specimens were found in one chamber, and, and Chamber, you're also reporting that you found a second chamber. Tell us, uh, Dr. Hawks, about the second place there. Yeah, so the first chamber, uh, is, the story is such an incredible adventure because it is deep inside the cave. It, it takes a half an hour for our team to get from the surface into this chamber, incredibly constrained, hard for our team to get down into it, but an incredible number of bones inside that chamber, and, and thousands still in there. We've excavated such a very small area. As we were excavating there, our explorers were going into other parts of the cave to see if they could understand the system as a whole. There's more than two kilometers of underground passages altogether in the system. And they found a, another chamber, a second chamber, that also had bones on the surface. We started investigating that chamber in 2014. Two years, uh, our team leader underground, Marina Elliott, has been excavating there with, with other members of the team. The place where the bones are most dense is a tiny little side passage that she can fit in only on her hands and knees or her belly and, and her feet sticking out. Uh, so it is really hard to excavate inside of it. The chamber is likewise difficult for our team to reach. Uh, I don't fit. I can't get in there. Uh, Lee Berger, the team leader, went down to the chamber once because he could squeeze through, and as he was trying to get out, was stuck. Mm. And we had to tie ropes to his arms to pull him out. Um, so it's dangerous. But inside this chamber, our, 
again, multiple individuals of, as we now know after studying them, Homo naledi. Hmm. And and did you you found an in, in intact skull inside the yeah. second chamber? There is there is a beautiful, nearly complete skull uh, and jaw, uh, a partial skeleton that goes with that skull. So we're looking at an individual. You know, it's sort of like the Lucy skeleton now of of Homo naledi, because you can see all of the anatomy in different regions of the skeleton and how they go together in one individual. Uh, we nicknamed the skull uh, and the skeleton Neo, uh, which is a word that means gift in the Sasutu language here. Wow, Susan, this is... What? <laughs> It's leaving me breathless. It right? must be leaving you uh, breathless. Uh, but the, the, inside, did you find any evidence of uh, habitation there? Any tools, food, anything that's fossilized that they left? They might have left behind. Yeah, in neither one of these chambers is there any artifact or anything that was carried in uh, other than the bones of the hominins. Uh, we have a very, very small number of, of other animal bones uh, in the Lissetti chamber, the new chamber. Uh, in the first chamber, the Dinaletti chamber, nothing there but ancient rodent pieces and a couple of bird bones. So, so they're very striking because in most contexts, we find you know, lots and lots of animal bones uh, for every hominin bone. Um, it, it was very difficult for our team to try to grapple with. Hmm. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in Please. there on, on a word, can I? Sure, uh, please. I'm going to jump in there on a, on a word that, that John used. There was no other evidence of things that were carried in. Um, because, um, John, you guys have made some kind of startling suggestions, or at least provocative suggestions, about how it was that the hominins um, got into these particular chambers in the cave, um, suggesting that maybe they've even been um, intentional burials, right? And I know you've gotten a lot of pushback on that. And I'm just wondering, in, in the new cave, um, what do you think the, the evidence is that's, that's similar to the other cave that, that this would you know, sort of build on that idea for you or on that conclusion for you? Sure. Um, it's a great question because in other cave systems in South Africa, um, we you know, look at the bones and there's usually some sign of how they entered the cave. Oftentimes, if they're carried in by predators or if predators have, have collected the bones and they've dropped in the cave, you'll see tooth marks. Uh, the bones will be crushed in characteristic ways by the teeth. You'll have uh, uh, fresh breaks on them that, that were made by the predators sort of crunching into them. Um, when bones are carried in by water, they get smoothed around the edges. Uh, you have a bunch of grit that comes in because the bones are being carried from a place that's closer to the surface. Um, when they fall in directly. Of course, there's an opening from above, uh, but also that carries with it characteristic sediments because it would have been open, including usually the bones of other animals. You know, as we started looking at these two assemblages, we found that they're very similar. There's no mark on any of the bones from any predator at all. Um, all of the skeleton is represented, including very tiny parts, and there are articulated parts of skeletons in both assemblages. So we know that bodies were getting into these. Uh, there's no sign that water was transporting anything. There's no opening from above. And so we, it's really a process of eliminating the things that work everywhere else. Mm -hmm. At the end, we thought, well, one reasonable hypothesis is that Homo naledi was responsible for this. They might have been taking bodies when individuals died into deeper parts of this cave system. All right. I have to remind everybody, uh, everybody that this is Science Friday from PRI, Public Radio International talking with uh, John Hawks and Susan Antone. But that is, uh, uh, Susan, that's like kind of speculative, you're saying, at this well, point. So I think that any time we come along um, a site, we have to uh, have as sort of our null hypothesis, if you will, our starting point, that there is some natural reason for this accumulation. And so while I wouldn't disagree that it's one um, feasible hypothesis for for how uh, individuals might have come to be in the cave. It seems to me that there could be other reasons for them being in the cave as well. I mean, perhaps they're using the cave system, and because they're using the cave system, they're also dying in the cave system, um, and that's that's why you're ending up with them. Um, you know, John John and the team have suggested that Homo naledi is using this as um, an intentional way of um, either burying or at least 
getting their remains away from the rest of the group. But, you know, if they are coexisting with um, other humans on the landscape, maybe it's other humans doing it. Or, in fact, you know, maybe they're, if Naledi is doing it themselves, maybe they're piling things up for not sort of ritual kinds of reasons, but simply because they're piling things up. I mean, my my dog makes little piles of things all over the yard, and I don't think that there's, you know, sort of ritual intention in that, um, but my maybe has to do with the way that, you know, they're using, they're using the cave system itself. So I think there's, having worked in burial caves uh, that were made by, you know, recently living humans, um, there are, you know, a number of strategies that you go through to try to figure out why it is that the the bones are are in the cave and kind of what they mean and there's a lot of different reasons even if you do uh, sort of intentionally inter something in the cave there's also a lot of different things that go on uh, for why you might do that so for example there's intentional interment because it's a ritual and it's a special place there's intentional interment because you're trying to hide it from an enemy that might desecrate the remains there's um, intentional interment that really is just about getting individuals kind of out of the way because dead individuals are kind of stinky messes. So yeah. um, there's, there are, I think, a vast number of hypotheses that kind of run the gamut um, of, of what could be driving this. Mm-hmm. All right. I'm going to take this is fascinating. Uh, we'll, we'll, we're going to extend it into the next segment. I'm going to take a break and come back and talk uh, more with uh, John Hawks and Susan Antone. And then we're going to bring in uh, another uh, anthropologist. Uh, Shelby Put is going to join us. She's going to she's going to talk about uh, stone tools and stuff like that and brain sizes. We're going to get granular. I know you like that. So stay with us. We'll be right back after this break. This is Science Friday. I'm Ira Plato. In case you're just joining us, we've been having a really fascinating discussion about uh, Homo naledi, one of the newest additions to the human family tree, with my guest uh, John Hawks, paleoanthropologist at uh, University of Wisconsin in Madison, uh, Susan Antone, professor of anthropology at uh, New York University. And now we're going to change gears a little bit and talk about uh, fossils themselves, not particularly the ones uh, from the Leti, but all fossils, and what they can tell us about a species and how early ancestors possibly think from brain size and things like that. How did the brain evolve? A different group of scientists have studied how our ancient brain evolved by looking how stone tools, you look at stone tools, you can learn about the brain. This week, their results were published in the journal Human uh, nature, Human Behavior. Uh, Shelby Put is one of the authors on that study. She's an anthropologist and postdoctoral researcher at the Stone Age Institute in Bloomington, Indiana. Welcome to Science Friday. Hi, thank you. So you try to study uh, how stone tools, the brains of normal people, uh, and, and how stone uh, normal quote, people. Quote, unquote, normal. Quote, unquote. They are undergraduates. <laughs> <laughs> we know everything we do by 18-year-olds, don't we? <laughs> so tell us about how you study the brains and, and, and link that to tool making. Right. So unfortunately, our intelligence doesn't... Uh, fossilize, right? So we have to find a unique way to to learn how uh, cognition evolved. And one way to do that is with stone tools, because really what stone tools are is cognition and action, because in order to make them, you have to think about it, right? Um, and so what we did was we taught uh, these students how to make Uh, stone tools from the past. We had them learn Oldowan stone tool making techniques and Oshulian stone tool making techniques. Now, the Oldowan is, we have discovered at first at 2.6 million years ago, but then at 1.8, around 1.8 million years ago, we see a new type of stone tool industry uh, show up in the archaeological record, and that's the Oshulian. So we go from this simpler method of just, you know, making a a simple flake to maybe Mm. cut something with to uh, actually designing a shape uh, with the core. And this requires, we think, a, a lot more thought process hmm. to do. And so, so, so you ask people to make these stone tools, and then you have, a, you have a wearable fMRI cap that they're wearing, so you can see well, what brain is part of the brain's lighting up in there? It's not fMRI, but it, it's, it's somewhat similar in that we are measuring um, uh, oxygenated hemoglobin 
and where it's at in different mm. parts of the brain. But the technique that we're using is called functional near infrared spectroscopy, which is kind of a mouthful. So we just <laughs> call it NEARS. Um, <laughs> And so, yeah, what do you, what do you this, learn about the with the parts of the brain that are that are engaged in the tool making? Um, so, what we actually found is that um, maybe what what you would expect that with um, the Oldowan technique, we see only like visual and manual coordination areas of the brain lighting up. But once you get to the Acheulean uh, technology, what we see is a cognitive network that involves a large portion of the cerebral cortex, um, including working memory areas, planning areas in the frontal cortex, as well as uh, these integrative areas in the temporal cortex. So they're, they're taking visual, auditory, and tactile information, holding it in mind long enough to reach these goals of making this more complex type of tool. So what does this tell you about, it, about evolution of the brain then? So uh, since we have, you know, modern people replicating the same exact process that these early hominins were doing, uh, we think what we're seeing is that um, the same type of brain network would have been required to make these complex stone tools around 1.8 million years ago. So what that tells us uh, is that we're seeing a more human-like way of thinking uh, starting quite early in our evolution. And what's so interesting about this is it coordinates with the fossil record uh, because we're seeing around the same time uh, a much larger brain size and body size, mm -hmm. and we see the appearance of Homo erectus, which I think has been mentioned a few times right. so yeah, far. Yeah, let, let me bring back uh, uh, John Hawks and Susan Antone. And, and John mm -hmm. and Susan, that the, the skull that was found... The Homo naledi skull, could that have been big enough to, you know, to make them stone tool makers? You know, it's, it's really a small brain. It's about a third the size of ours. Uh, the, the range that we have now of the brain sizes of Homo naledi overlaps a bit with, with Homo erectus, but it's definitely small, and, and we have, you know, smaller ones than any erectus. For us, of course, the big question is, is size the big issue or is it structure? And, and looking at what we can see of the inside surface of the, of the skull of Naledi, which tells us something about the external surface of the brain, but not as much as you might like, um, it looks like it is somewhat human-like in some ways. So maybe there's something structural that triggers the later evolution of, of larger size in, in some lineages of hominins, but, uh, but other lineages like Naledi seem to be able to persist for a long time without evolving those big brains. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the th one of the things we've been seeing recently, actually, is that there's actually quite a lot of size variation within Homo erectus, and so there are likely to be some scaling patterns. So that you may have, as John says, you have the structural relationships that are in place, and they may be in place regardless of whether you have large size or small size. But they may be, you know, sort of scaling with the size of the individual as, as well. So I think this is one case in which um, size itself is really not the main thing that we should be um, worried about. I hate to say it, but it, you know, size probably doesn't matter in this instance, but that the structural underpinnings really do. Uh, and one of the things that I thought was cool, and I actually have a, a question, um, is uh, in, that, in that study where they were teaching undergraduates how to, to make stone tools, um, I think I remember that some of the, the students were instructed sort of with language and, and some were instructed um, uh, with just sort of visual cues, right? Yeah. And there's, there's been that um, question as to whether or not language is sort of associated with uh, abilities to make stone tools. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and if I'm re remembering right, you were only seeing those centers light up when, uh, when people had been instructed with language, is that right? Right. So previous studies have looked at what's going on in the brain while making stone tools, and what they found were a lot of language processing areas showing up. Um, but unfortunately, they didn't actually control for language in their study, and yet they were still making these larger claims about language evolution. So what we wanted to do in this study was to make sure that we controlled for language. And yeah, like you pointed out, um, what we ended up seeing is that language processing areas of the brain were only lighting up um, in the group that learned with verbal instructions mm -hmm. and not in the other group.
Well, I want to thank you all for taking time to be with us today. It's fascinating, and, and I'm sure, John, you're going to go back and dig up some more caves somewhere? We are still exploring in the field. <laughs> we have made new fossil discoveries, and we're investigating now. Uh, Lee Berger and I have a book that's just come out, Almost Human, that gives goes through some of those explorations. So uh, we, it's an exciting time, just well, as Susan said. People could apply that name to me, too. Thank you very much <laughs> for taking time to be with us. Uh, Shelby Put, anthropologist and postdoctoral researcher at the Stone Age Institute in Bloomington, Indiana. John Hawks, paleoanthropologist, University of uh, Wisconsin in Madison. And Susan Antone, professor of anthropology at NYU. And we have a 3D model of the Homo naledi fossil. You can spin it around and take a closer look up at it uh, at our website at sciencefriday.com slash bones. Next up, something, when, you know, when I go out and meet our Science Friday fans, they tell me, Ira, I wish there was more than one day of Science Friday every week. If you can find yourself nodding in agreement, wouldn't you like to have more Science Friday? Well, I am happy to announce that SciFry just launched a new science show this week. It's an audio documentary style podcast called Undiscovered. And I've got the co hosts right here in the studio to take us on a tour. Ella Fetter and Annie Minoff are the producers and hosts of Undiscovered. Welcome. Thank you so much, Thanks, Ira. Ira. Yeah, so our, our new show is Undiscovered, as you mentioned. Um, and it launched on Tuesday. We're so, <laughs> very excited. so tell us what it's about. <laughs> okay, so Undiscovered is about the backstories of science. Um, and, and I guess, you know, a, a good science story is going to tell you what, what the scientists actually found, one mm -hmm. would hope. <laughs> one would hope. Uh, but we wanted to go a bit beyond that, take a peek behind the scenes, figure out how they figured out what, what the actual findings were in the end. Did they toil for years in misery? Did they make a, a big mistake at some point? Was there a left turn? They were studying X. It turned out to be Y. Was there a lucky break? Um, yeah, so we wanted to make a whole show just about that. Yeah, and, you know, we're doing it with sound and with music. Every episode is one story, so... I can't say it's like a long read, yeah. but I guess it's a long listen. So what's the, give us an idea of the first episode that we'll be hearing. Yeah. It's up there now, ready to It is. Podcast. It's at undiscoveredpodcast.org, or you can find us on Apple Podcasts, Undiscovered. Anyway, the first episode uh, is inspired by a Science Friday story. So a while back, you had on the show Gary King. He's a data scientist up at Harvard. And some years ago, Gary and his grad students were downloading millions of Chinese language social media posts. And they thought they were doing this for this big data study about teaching computer computers to analyze text. Uh, that was the plan. Yeah, that uh, was plan <laughs> A. That's not, not what ended up happening. So partway through this, this big project, they noticed something a little weird. They go back to the URLs where these social media posts had been, and the links are sometimes broken. They get these weird uh, messages, and they realize that the posts have, are gone. So at first, um, they think they've done something wrong, potentially. But then at one point, they go to a page, and, and they see something that clarifies what's happening. Over on the bottom right-hand corner, there was a little picture of a little cartoon police officer that we have what? we've a little a little picture of a police officer. That's right. Uh, eventually, we learned that there's cartoon internet police, and they're Jing Jing and Cha Cha, and they, they have names. They have names. Yes, you can Google them, um, and you'll find these these funny little pictures. And they put them everywhere just to remind you that you're you're being watched. So, you know, when you're looking China's censorship mascots in the face, you know that there's nothing wrong with your data. And what's happening is that these social media posts are being censored. And so Gary and his students think, oh, my gosh, we have this giant database of posts. Some of them were later censored. Some weren't. We can answer this question. What will get you censored on the Chinese Internet? What does the government not want on the Web? Well, right. I would think it's something about the government, right? They right. don't want you yeah. to talk about the government. <laughs> exactly. Saying nasty things about yeah. the government maybe would get you censored. <laughs> and, you, and you found? Well, so if, if that was the answer, that would be, that a, would be a really uh, boring episode. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That is not what they found. So, so Gary and his team, they're looking at their data, and, and they see that sometimes people are posting things that are very critical of the government, and they, they seem to be getting away with it. Let me just be clear about this. You can say the leaders of this town are all stealing money. Uh, they're putting it in overseas bank accounts, and here's the bank accounts, and here's how much money. Um, and by the way, they all have mistresses, and here are their names. That will not be censored. Wow. Um, so we were quite confused for a while. I'm Ira Flato. This is Science Friday from PRI, Public Radio International, with uh, Ella Fetter and Annie Minoff. We're talking about the first episode of Undiscovered, our new podcast. So, so, so what, what happened? happened? So, so Gary and his team, it's, it's not what they think is getting censored. And so this episode is about 
what they figure out is actually being censored on the Chinese internet. Yep. And actually, for this episode, it's not just scientists who we're talking to. We actually spoke to a pretty prominent user on a Chinese social media platform called Weibo. So you can kind of think of this like Chinese Twitter. Um, So a few years ago, this guy was posting some very critical things about the Chinese internet on his Weibo account. Um, Yeah. And and those things weren't being taken down. He was accusing officials of corruption, uh, seemed to be getting away with it. So... We talked to him about, you know, what happened. It's a pretty dramatic story. Um, But also, we asked him to kind of describe for us, you know, what is Chinese social media like? And the analogy he went to uh, was not what I was expecting. Um, Have you seen Game of Thrones? Hidden within Game of Thrones are a lot of issues with China's internet censorship. First, there's the game of the various government departments. Different departments are battling it out for the right to manage the internet. And secondly, among the people using the internet, two different camps emerge. Some maybe really do support the government. Some maybe just want to get something out of siding with the government. Yeah, so so not the answer we were expecting. Game of Thrones. Chinese Just social like, media. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but the, the point he's making is that it, as a user of Chinese social media on the ground, it can be pretty complicated to okay. figure out uh, to figure out the rules, to figure out what you're allowed to post and what's going to get you in trouble. And, and what's not. And data can be a clarifying way to try to figure out, well, what is actually going on here. Um, and so that's what we talk about in this yeah, episode. That episode is already online. You can you can get it um, at undiscoveredpodcast.org. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Give us an idea of some other stuff that's coming up. Oh, than, man. Uh, um, okay, so uh, another episode you'll get, uh, we have a geologist who heads down to Antarctica to look for little pieces of planets and asteroids. She, she's going meteorite hunting, and she also describes for us, you know, what is it like to work in the middle of nowhere, Antarctica? Yeah, that's, so that's our one. next episode. Yeah. Uh, also coming up, we we uh, actually this is a historical one. We look at a sex researcher in pre-Nazi Germany, and he was actually the first person to try to prove using a, a type of science uh, that gay people were born gay, which mm. was a, a pretty radical yeah. idea at the time. Yeah. yeah, and and so the idea of undiscovered is you are discovering undiscovered things. Uh, We are talking to the people who discovered the undiscovered things. Yeah. But the idea behind that name is, you know, um, we're interested in the story before they knew the answer. So while while the answer was still undiscovered, if you will. And you were uh, and they were undiscovered by you, too, until you went in and dug (laughs) them up. Uh, Yeah, that's that's true. There's a form (laughs) of discovery on our part, too, for sure. Many things about this process have been. So just so (laughs) our listeners know who's Ella and who's. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. I'm Ella. This voice, this voice is the Annie voice. Your voice is not normally this low. <laughs> and and that's, that's Ella. That's her smooth radio voice. Yeah, I'm Ella. Yeah. Well, it looks like you two have a good time together. You're yeah, good communicators we do. and you yeah. have good chemistry. I, and hopefully people have a good time listening. You know, that's the idea. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, great, great. And what, what, it's up there now, right? They can yes, download. Yes. Available on discoveredpodcast.org or on Apple Podcasts or right. wherever you download podcasts. Wherever you download podcasts there you these go. days. Andy Minoff and Ella Fetter co hosts and produces with a new podcast, Undiscovered. And as you say, you can get it on Apple Podcasts wherever you get your audio fix. Um, and we want your ratings and your reviews. Tell your friends. Catch up with us on the web at undiscoveredpodcast.org. That's about all the time we have for this hour. Charles Berquist is our director, our senior producer, Christopher Intagliata. Our producers are Alexa Lim, Christy Taylor, Katie Heiler. Rich Kim is our technical director. Sarah Fishman and Jack Horowitz are engineers at the controls here at the studios of our production partners, the City University of New York. Wishing everybody's mother out there a happy Mother's Day.